education for adults. I took a course at Jesse Institute. It was kind of disappointing. Mm -hmm. And um, it just seemed very conventional. It's like he's an engineer on the side. But um, would, you, would part of your answer be, well, on iPad, the internet learner can, there's other ways uh, to get the iPod, will, iPad will let me uh, sidestep Well, sure. I mean, we're focused on language, and yeah. most of our learners are adults. Uh, the typical distance education offerings are very similar to what's done in traditional classroom. They have the advantage, though, that they end it all up with a test and a diploma. So, therefore, people go there because they end up with a diploma. Uh, the advantage is not so much the iPad, but if a person... You know, to me, the ideal world would be that schools cannot give diplomas. There should be diploma-granting testing organizations quite independent of the schools. So if I want to gather all the information relevant to whatever, I go out and find it. And when I think I'm ready, I go to the testing and I spend a week there. And I get properly tested, and if I pass, I get my degree. But right now, it's because they offer the diploma, therefore you've got to go through their course however bad the course is. The advantage, again, accessing via the iPad, for example, or via your computer, uh, the resources that are out there is that there are universities that put all their courses on the internet. MIT does this. Uh, I think the, in, in language, the University of Texas at Austin or something. There's more and more universities and undoubtedly schools and, uh, you know, for high school math, there's this guy in the United States called Cam. K-H-A-N, he's got CAN, the CAN Academy, and he's got hundreds of lectures on math and science and stuff like that. There's just a tremendous amount of very good learning content on the web, but very often they don't give you a diploma. So I think the thing about traditional distance education is people go there because they're going to get a diploma. Yeah. So we'll try mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. No problem. Oh, yes, sir. No, no more fear. Yeah. So uh, just uh, I like uh, very much uh, what you said, your approach, because to me uh, you are saying uh, the the way nature works is best. Yes. Because uh, you 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 learn as a child coming into this this world right. and uh, culture, mm -hmm. and it's exactly how he he does. Yes. So uh, it's a very natural way to to look at it and. Mm -hmm. uh, I had no idea when I came here because I, I thought it was about the uh, e-part, but uh, this is better than that. Yeah, I know. I should have thought of it yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I was trying to ask about uh, my own, uh, relating, I guess, my own experience trying to learn languages in class. Every, you know, uh, for a long time, it's just a question of reading and, and being technical tutored, but then I'm still translating in my head everything. Right. I'm just translating, 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 and uh, it's a big hurdle. Now, are there tricks in your system that sort of get, get beyond that, or do you just ignore it? You know, the, do, or do you still sort of start off by translating? Okay, well, again, I, what I do, when I start a language, I will listen many, many times to the same content at the beginning. And not know what that content is? Oh, no, because I read it. Oh, okay. I read it, oh, you read it I look it up. Yeah, and sure. I'm starting initially with a 30-second bit of content, okay. and it's easy. And so all the words, and in fact, what we do is, for our beginner content, we have the parallel, same beginner content in all 11 languages. Mm -hmm. So I can actually go and look at it in English. And I can also look up each word. And I'll listen to that content 10 times. And then, and we'll have those typically in a series. So there's like 26 episodes of this mm -hmm. stuff. So the first one, I do the second one, then first and second, first, second, third. And I listen over and over and over again. And what that tends to do is it tends to ingrain certain words and phrases you're sort of on your brain. And as you progress, you do that less often. As you progress, you start to listen once or twice. Uh, because you're keen. Now that you can actually do something with the language, you want to hear more and more and more. Uh, and read more and more different things. But I find that that, in the initial period, really sort of ingrains certain phrases. So that when you go to speak, the phrase will start to go up. So you, you don't have to piece it together word for word. What is this? What is that? And put it together. You just let yourself go. And so after a while, you develop enough confidence that you know that whatever kind of phrase starts to roll out of your mouth, 
it's going to more or less be okay. But if you think about it too much, it's a bit like, like the old story about the centipede was asked which leg he put forward first, and then he could walk it. You know, or, or golf, if you, if you think too much about your golf swing, you can't hit the golf ball. So you kind of have to let yourself go. And that comes with a certain amount of confidence. But I find that if I spend the first two, three months, like I'll, with Russian, I went a year, I just beat anybody. So I happen personally, like something you want to talk right away, I don't. And getting back to nature, the shyness. So I'm quite happy to listen, depending on the language, for three, six months. And then it comes a point where you want to say something. Rather than the traditional approach is to sit someone down and say, okay, this is a pen. Repeat, this is a pen. No, I'm not ready to say this is a pen. Uh, maybe in six months I'll say this is a pen. Right? I'm just happy to take it. And so you let the brain gradually, gradually get used to it. And don't put pressure. And I personally believe that where they put pressure on people,